In this section, we are going to be taking a critical look at human water usage. What types of human activities demand the most water uh, and how that is affecting global fresh water supply. Fresh water is a significant sustainability issue because humans put a big strain on the fresh water resources that are available on our planet. The demand for water by humans is also exacerbated by changing climate conditions that are bringing about drought and water scarcity conditions in many regions, including our own. This that you see here is a satellite time lapse um, that we also saw previously in Chapter 1 of Arizona's largest lake, Lake Powell, between 1991 and 2015. And you can see how the lake has been drying up. On top of that, human demand for fresh water is going to continue to increase in future years because the world population is continuing to grow and people will require fresh water to serve their domestic needs. And the growing world population will also need to be fed and growing food takes a lot of water. In fact, 70% of fresh water withdrawals worldwide are used for agriculture. And finally, um, much of the population growth is slated to take place in countries that are developing and in the process of industrializing. And with that process comes a shift uh, that we are already seeing to a diet that includes more meat and dairy products. And meat and dairy products are more water intensive to produce than plant foods because they are another step up the food chain. So we're gonna come back to the issue of water scarcity later in this section, but first we're gonna look at water use in the US, including um, what that water use has looked like in the past and also what it looks like today. So in the country as a whole, demand for fresh water increased steadily in conjunction with the growing population between 1950 and 1980. In this figure, what you see is the total US population represented by the red line, and the bars represent fresh water withdrawals. The white bar is the amount of groundwater being withdrawn, the blue is the amount of surface water being withdrawn, and then the black bar is the total of the two together. So you can see the population keeps going up, but at some point the water withdrawals stabilize, and then later they even drop. So why did this happen? Well, you'll remember me saying just a moment ago that agriculture accounts for 70% of water usage worldwide. And in the US, agriculture is actually a close second to um, thermoelectric power in terms of water use by sector, but agriculture is a huge driver of water consumption nonetheless. And the years 1950 to 1980 were the height of the Green Revolution. Um, agriculture was expanding into new regions, uh, namely drier regions that didn't have the rainfall to support cropland, but were relying on irrigation. So in this graph, you can see the number of irrigated acres in the U.S. shown in the black line, and you can see a sharp upward trend in the number of irrigated acres between about 1940 and 1990. And after that, things kind of stabilize. But the other thing you'll notice is that the line shown in red represents the water used per irrigated acre. So in other words, how much water is being applied to an acre of cropland on average. And this red line starts going down and has continued to trend downward as more farmers and large agricultural operations adopt more efficient irrigation practices, like drip irrigation or sprinkler irrigation, which deliver the water to the plants in a more precise way compared to traditional irrigation approaches that involve flooding the entire field. So the number of acres of irrigated croplands stopped going up so sharply, and then people got more efficient about how they delivered their irrigation water, resulting in a stabilization of fresh water withdrawals. The other thing that happened is that the thermoelectric power sector started using less water. So this is water that is used to cool power plants and generating stations. In this figure, the yellow bar is the one that shows water withdrawals for the thermoelectric power sector. And you can see how it has dropped steadily from the year 2005 onward. And this is because there has been a shift away from coal power plants and toward natural gas as a fuel source. Um, and in, in addition, power plants have become more efficient about the way they use their water. So for example, just in the four year period between 2015 and 2019, power plants in the US use 20% less water to produce the same amount of energy 
because they were using that water more efficiently. However, the thing about thermoelectric power water usage is that it is almost entirely non-consumptive use. So remember, non-consumptive use is when water is removed from a source, but then it's returned back to the source after it is used. So because the thermoelectric power sector uses water for cooling, that water gets pulled out of its source, like a river, for example, um, is used to cool a nuclear reactor or whatever component of the power plant it's needed for, and then it gets returned to the river. So really that water is not actually used up. Consumptive water use is the type of water use when the water is removed from the source and does not get put back. So knowing this, if we look at total water use in the United States, thermoelectric is up there with irrigation. Um, in this figure, thermoelectric is shown in navy blue. It's the big, big chunk in navy blue. Irrigation is shown in yellow. And these numbers are billions of gallons of water used per day. So billions per day. And to be clear, these numbers here are actually somewhat outdated. They come from the year 1990, but the U.S. Geological Survey hasn't actually published any data on total versus consumptive water use since 1990. Um, they're currently preparing a report on the period between 2000 and 2020, but it hasn't been released yet. So if we want to compare total water use to consumptive water use, we have to use the 1990 data for now. And looking at that data, thermoelectric rivals irrigation in terms of total water use, total water withdrawals. But remember, thermoelectric uses water almost entirely non-consumptively. If we use uh, the, the instead, if we instead look at consumptive use, um, then irrigation just takes over. Irrigation again shown in yellow. The agriculture sector is by far the most significant user of water in a consumptive manner, meaning that this water does not get returned to the source. 77 billion gallons every single day are used for agricultural irrigation in the U.S. So this gives you an idea of how agriculture puts pressure on our freshwater resources. But of course, we're not trying to villainize agriculture. We have to be mindful of the fact that the ultimate purpose of growing crops is to feed people. Um, to produce calories that can provide nutrition. And in this regard, not all sources of nutrition are equal in terms of their water consumption. This graph here provides a breakdown of how many liters of water are required to produce a calorie of energy from these different food types. So fruit uses a lot of water because it has a high water content and not a lot of calories in general. On the right side of the graph, milk, eggs, and red meat are also high because in order to raise cows for milk or meat or raise chickens, you first have to grow the crops that are used to create their feed. So it's sort of like that biomagnification phenomenon that we talked about previously, where as you move up the food chain, the amount of water required to support that organism becomes more concentrated. You don't just have to consider the water that the cow drinks but also all of the water that was used to grow, um, you know, the corn, wheat, barley, all, all of the grains that are being used to feed that cow. But the really interesting one is nuts. Nuts require a higher investment of blue water per calorie than any other category of food. Um, a number that puts this in perspective is the fact that in California, one of the biggest agricultural states in the U.S., almonds alone use 17% of all agricultural water usage. And there are over 400 different crops that are grown commercially in California. And just almonds, only one type of nut, uses 17% of the agricultural water. So raising nuts is a very water inefficient process. We can also look at calories sourced from different types of nutritional molecules. So for example, this graph, shows the amount of liters of blue water required to produce not just any calorie, but a calorie of protein specifically, which protein is an essential source of nutrition that your body needs. Fruits are again very high because there is very little protein in fruit and they have a very high water content. But then again, we have nuts showing up with over 20 liters of water being required to produce a single calorie of protein in the form of nuts. So even with the food chain effect that occurs with food sources like milk and eggs and red meat, nuts are still far less water efficient at delivering protein to your diet. 
the most water efficient source of protein is legumes, which includes things like bees, beans and peas. Um, a final important lens for viewing water consumption in the US is patterns of consumption by region. So in this figure, the dots of different colors uh, correspond to water consumption by sector. So yellow is thermoelectric, green is irrigation, blue is public supply like domestic and municipal city water, uh, red is industrial, and then gray is other. And as you can see, water withdrawals in the western half of the country are primarily dedicated to irrigation because there's a lot of cropland in this region, but also relatively less rainfall compared to the east, um, where the primary driver of withdrawals in the east is thermoelectric power. There's a lot more going on in this image too, so I encourage you to pause the video and, and read in more detail the text on the image if you're interested um, in more of the nuances of how water use varies around the country. The final topic that we'll touch on before closing out this section on water use is water scarcity. So water scarcity is the term used to describe situations where the need for water surpasses the available supply. And there are two types of water scarcity. The first is physical scarcity, which is where there's not enough water in existence to meet the demands of a region. So the Southwest US is an example of a region that is headed in the direction of physical scarcity as our drought conditions continue to erode our water supply and we continue to overdraw our aquifers. The other type is economic scarcity. And this is where um, enough fresh water exists and is available to meet a region's needs, but the infrastructure to treat that water and make it safe to use or to supply it to people does not exist. Because even regions of the world that have abundant amounts of water can experience water scarcity if they don't have water treatment plants or water line systems, sewage systems, all of that other infrastructure that's needed to maintain a stable supply of safe water. So economic scarcity is primarily experienced by people in developing nations that are still in the process of industrializing because these nations often lack the resources to invest in some of the most effective approaches to minimizing water scarcity, which include more efficient methods of agricultural irrigation, transitioning to more water efficient appliances, uh, building water storage infrastructure like dams and reservoirs that can stabilize the amount of water that's available year round rather than relying on seasonal ebbs and flows, and reducing water pollution by minimizing agricultural and industrial runoff of hazardous chemicals into the water supply. So in our next section, we are going to be taking a closer look at this last one as we get into water pollution and water quality issues.